and we're live. It is March 25th, Thursday evening here in the UK, and it is time for the really big class. And um, my usual spiel has been that, that to get very excited about my guest for the for the day and to tell you all about them and when I met them and and um, that would be awkward today since I am going to be teaching the class myself. So um, I don't need to do that, but I am very excited that I get to, to um, take the hot seat for the day and get to hear these wonderful performers. Um, before we get into the music, I just thought I'd recap a bit um, of, about the last year. So I came across a Facebook posting today. They send you your memories and a memory from last year. Uh, March 25th, 2020, was that I was considering starting this, this Zoom masterclass series. Um, and I was, I was putting out feelers to see if my violin community, my friends in the violin community would be interested in teaching, performing, watching, and if they thought it was a good idea. And I thought that was ironic to come across today because here we are a year later still um, enjoying each other's company on Thursdays with some violin music. I never ever would have guessed that this would be such a long-lived idea. Although from the very beginning, I had people saying to me, you should keep this going even after after lockdown, after quarantine. Um, we should keep doing this. It's so great to bring together a community of, of like-minded musicians um, from all across the world. So I'm, I'm really amazed that this has worked as well as it has. I've had, um, I haven't counted the final total. I think after tonight it'll be something like 138 performers. Um, this is class number 30 something. I took a little break in the summer so we don't have 52 weeks of classes but it, we are coming up to a year of classes. So thank you to everyone who has participated, everyone who has helped fund the classes. I've been able to pay my, my guest artists um, every week which has just been a, a really wonderful thing to be able to offer to um, to my colleagues in a time where there's so little work to be had. And I think for the, for the performers, it's also been an, a, an amazing thing to have things to work towards um, in a time when they're, they're, it's just hard to count on anything happening. So um, it's been a privilege to do this and um, the class is gonna take a slightly different form in the next few months. And I don't know whether it'll continue past May, but I do have plans through May. We can talk about that a little bit later. My performers today are Magdalena, Casey, and Tamara, and we have three amazing pieces of violin repertoire. And as I was performing, uh, performing, as I was preparing for the class today, I was doing some reading and I realized that actually these three works, it's kind of appropriate given what the, the direction the class is going to go in May with uh, bringing in composers and, and violinists together. Because each of these pieces, uh, Isai's Fourth Sonata, Sanson's Third Concerto and the Mendelssohn Concerto were written for like the preeminent violinists of their time. And um, I think that's a very cool coincidence that we have here today. We also have two pieces in E minor and one in B minor, which was completely unplanned. So it's sort of a dark and, and, and brooding key world that we're going to live in today. And um, I think without saying too much more, we'll just get into the performers. Um, first, we have Magdalena. She is going to play the first movement of the Isai Sonata No. 4. This is the one written for Chrysler, and the first movement is titled Alamand. Thank you. 
Bravo. Beautiful flame. Let me just get myself organized here. I'm going to add a pin to you, take this away, and now you're full screen. So um, I warned you all that in, when we were doing our sound check that I would be asking you questions. So here is where you need to, you're going to have to do some of the work here. So it's this format of sending in a video and then watching it together is a little bit unusual. Normally when you play in a masterclass, you, you perform and you're hopefully not worrying too much about what's happening as it's happening. You're focused on, on what, what you want to be getting across rather than um, analyzing what you've just done. But this situation's a little bit different. So what do you think as you sit there and watch that with me here? Um, yeah, mostly, mostly I'm fine. Sometimes I'm thinking like some tempos could be a bit different or I'm thinking like, is this the right tempo for this part? And of course yeah, I'm thinking of doing chords, like even nice and some chords are still crushed and I noticed that. <laughs> The chords in, in this movement are, are quite tricky and I have maybe a couple of things that will help you towards the end with those chords. Um, but for the most part, I mean, you, you've really worked it out very nicely, how, like the how to play things. I don't know if you watched the class last week. Tom, Tom Stone was talking about the whys and the hows of violin playing. And that's been very much on my mind since, since that class, like why, we, like why we're doing it in the first place and then how we accomplish it. So I think in a lot of ways that the how you're accomplishing it is working pretty well. And I, I know that you'll, you know, you'll work more on it. And, and I'm not too concerned about you coming to a, a result that you're very pleased with in that way. Um, one more question for you, just in terms of your playing in general, is there's, I always like to know when I see someone once, um, it, I think it's helpful to know if there's anything in particular that's on your mind with your violin playing. Are you working on you're shifting or on your bowing or is there something that like a big violin-y topic that's been on your mind? Um, yeah, mostly I've been working to um, use more bow because I had some um, trouble with my um, with the finger here. I had a little strange bump and also after some time it starts hurting. So I've been working how to have a nice and full sound right at the tip and bow changes at the tip. Um, so I've been working on that and keeping the shoulder relaxed and yeah. Good. Is the thing on your finger, is it a cyst? Is some kind of... I need, I need to check it. Like it's, uh, it's, it hasn't been a problem before, but now I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely worth having, having it looked at yeah. medically because there are things about playing that, you know, can make other physical problems worse or can come up because of playing. So please promise me that you'll you'll go get that looked at. Um, okay, so as I pulled this piece back out, knowing that you were going to play it, some things came, came to my mind. Um, first of all, and this is because I've spent a lot of time with Bach in the last six months, as we all have. Um, I was thinking about the fact that, that this is titled Alamanda. And compared to say the second Isai Sonata, which is so clearly modeled on Bach, I mean, quoting Bach, and the first Sonata, which is also very clearly modeled on Bach, this, at least to my mind, is a little less clear that this is based on a Bach Allemand. Um, it, it has elements of French overture. I, th I hope you'd agree that it has sort of that rhythm in there. Mm -hmm. um, but it has a kind of a bizarre meter change from four eight to 3-8, but the 3-8 doesn't feel like, at least to me, doesn't feel like 3-8. It still feels like 4-8. And I'm not quite sure why Isai put that in there. Do you know where I'm talking about? This is bar, um, what is it? The bar numbers aren't there. One, it's the sixth line or so, where we have the tempo and we're in 3-8, but it's still grouped in, in patterns of two. Um, later on, he very clearly is in three, but that's unusual for an allemand. It's the wrong meter. And then he ends the movement with a little mini fugue-like thing, right? Mm -hmm. So he's sort of throwing in a lot of elements of Bach um, into this very romantic, it, I don't know, impressionistic sort of, I looked up when it was written 1923, you know, it's sort of this 20th century language, but with these, uh, these older bits. So 
that was one thing on my mind very much and about the as you said the feeling the rhythm of it and figuring out how to get the chords to work within the rhythm of it so that's one thing i thought we could talk about interesting you should bring up using your whole bow because that was another thing i thought we could talk about Isai, for those of you who haven't studied these sonatas, ha it's almost like learning a code. I remember this was the first Isai piece I was given as a as a student, and I remember feeling like I like I had to keep referring to the the key at the beginning of the of the book that says, okay, well this bracket means this to Isai, and this circle means this to Isai. Do you feel that way too? Like I mean, it's it's a different way of writing. Yeah, yeah, a bit. And knowing that Isai was this great violinist, this amazing pedagogue, and using this very specific key of how his music is to be played, one of the things that he does mark are these full bows. And I don't know if you've paid particular attention to that or discussed that with your teacher in a, any way, have you? Um, I'm not, uh, I probably don't have the best edition, but like, how does he mark the full He bow? marks it. Um, Basically with a bracket. So like that. Oh, these, yeah, yeah, these. Um, yep. And he writes that underneath the staff and it, in the little key at the beginning of the, the, the edition, it says that that means to use your tout l'arché, so the, in, the entire bow, right? And what I've never known, I should know this, is whether that means over the whole slur or for that note because it's very specific. And I think it would be fun for us to go through a little bit and find the places where you can use a wash of bow on a single note and see what it does. It's not practical. Obviously, you can't use your whole bow on one note and then still play 10 notes afterwards. Mm -hmm. But that, that's something I thought we could talk about. So um, would you mind playing from the beginning? Um, play up to where it changes meter. So the pause at the end of the fifth line or so. And let's just see how this goes. <laughs> to do that immediately that was amazing so it's unusual isn't it where he marks those those things what why do you think they're there yeah because i, I think it needs some more um sound and more air and more movement on those notes like i always but i never thought of really taking the whole bowl on those. yeah and obviously i mean it's it, it is impractical because he marks that for instance in the second bar and you have four notes to play after it so you can't, it, it will never work. But what it did, um, sorry, we're getting a question mark. Could you maybe answer that for me so that I can keep going? It's about audio. Um, every, you can hear me fine, yeah? Okay, so if you pull your bow, so I'm gonna run into my desk if I use that much bow. It lightens that, and then, then did you notice, I think you did, because I watched you do it, in bar three, he doesn't mark it the same way. So here, more evenly distributed. Could you try just the first four bars again and be even more exaggerated? So, so really, and let the little notes be too light as a result. Good, good. 
Now, I'm not saying you have to, in the end, play it that in that extreme a way, but it, it shows you a little something about what he might have been thinking. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing that I, I love about these first four bars is thinking about what changes and what doesn't. Have you thought about that a little bit in terms of the, the pitches? Because it's just an elaboration, like one bar elaborates on the last one. So could you keep that idea of bow distribution and now really build the four bars thinking about the notes that are new rather than the notes that repeat? So you have twice. We don't care about it the second time as much as we did the first time. We care about and then then we hold on to that note. And you can build through that to make a four bar phrase. Try one more time. Yeah, tempo wise, can it go a bit more forward once it comes higher? Try it. Let's see. So did you feel like you moved ahead a lot? Mm, maybe at the third one, but then to, towards the last one, I didn't go faster. I, I felt like you, you moved just, you hinted at it. And for me, it, it was definitely not too much. Yeah. One more thing to think about in these first four bars. So keep the, the structure that you just did, but could you try keep, because we want to think about the rhythm in terms of how it might be related to Baroque music. Think about always having the same feeling rhythmically. So it's not then, it's and see how you, if you enjoy that. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's um, it's it's better to make them more singular, not too distorted. For me, it gives it a little bit more feeling. It like it might be a dance. Mm-hmm. It might might be setting up. I mean, this this is introductory music, right? But it might be setting up the feeling of a different of a dance. The only thing I'd say is you really like to pull this last one. <laughs> which I understand it, it, it. The notes are nice, it's juicy, it's up on the G string. It's nice to feel that way, but it's also the point of most urgency. So you could try that in your practice. Good, let's go on. Um, just just cascade down through this one more time um, and, and we'll get to the tune. <laughs> play that so well um I really like it's amazing to me that you can just pick out those those lines and bring them uh with more bow when it's not what you had practiced that's terrific could we try one thing physically that I think might help with what's going on so when you play do you feel like you move this way or this way you see what I, the difference so does your, do your violin and your bow kind of go together, or do they go in contrary motion? I, I don't know really. I've... Let's try something. Let's try it both ways. And I, this is a horrible passage to make you do this with, but I'm, you can do it. So you'll, I can't do it, but you will. Let's just take that first one. If you bring, feel like your bow goes to the violin, kind of like you're rocking this way, 
as one way of mo motion. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm not saying this is right or wrong. We're just experimenting. So that's kind of one set of motion. Now can you try the opposite so that your violin goes one direction and your bow goes the other? Try that one more time. So that is a, a way of using what's called contrary motion. The other is, I don't know the opposite word for that, sympathetic motion maybe. Does one feel more natural to you than the other? Or more more uh, familiar? Um, the contrary feels nice because I don't lose the contact on the A string. Good. This is what I want you to think about. So let's add, now you got that by sort of doing this, instead of thinking to move your violin at all, can you just keep your violin very stable? I can't see your whole body, but I want you to imagine that your left foot is planted underneath the violin, like, like a tree, like you've got this sort of very strong, stable trunk. But trees can move, right? Trees move in the wind, so that they don't just stay completely rigid. So that's holding your violin. And now with your bow, you can move this way without anything interfering in that contact, which is what we want to keep. Good. Now, an interesting side effect is your shifting is a little bit more secure. Do you feel that? Try one more time and imagine, I wish I could reach out through my computer and hold your scroll. So have you ever had a teacher hold your scroll or have you lean against a wall? Yes, against the wall, yeah. Okay, so imagine, the holding it's a little bit nicer because I could move it a little bit. So imagine that I'm being a very nice supportive um, point for your scroll and do the same thing. Good, and then do that and go on, because as you go to the G string, you're now going to need to bring your elbow, exactly. Good, do you feel the difference when you do that? I think the result in the sound, of course we're on Zoom and it's a little hard to tell, is that you're getting a more natural resonance on the G string. Mm -hmm. And the one time that you got a squeaky note as you came across, mm -hmm. your violin came down at the same moment that your bow came down. So you went <laughs> instead of <laughs> so that you have resistance underneath the bow. Just try, sorry, I'm getting stuck, but try <laughs> So, so you never lose that contract, contact. Good. You feel the difference? I think that'll help you because I can tell you're thinking about not raising your shoulder. But if your violin is moving around, it's very hard to keep the shoulder stable because you're chasing the violin. Mm -hmm. So if you can keep this sort of, right? Good, go on. Ah, I'm gonna stop you right away because you went. Uh... Could you just play the melody, play? Let's do that again, and I really want you to pay, like, imagine that you have a light beam shining out from the end of your scroll, and I can, at your music stand, and you don't want that to move. 
so you don't want to be drawing something crazy. You want, if anything, it's like a very small circle. Better. Do you feel the difference? Mm, yeah. Now, can you do the same thing with your left foot and have it have this this strong but flexible tree trunk underneath your violin? <laughs> ah, 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 ah. <laughs> keep keep stable. It's good and it's sounding more resonant. Your habit, I think, from seeing you play for five minutes, mm -hmm. is that when you come to the to the frog, to the heel, you drop the violin. Mm -hmm. Is this familiar? So yeah. if you here, let's go slower. I'm gonna leave out leave out the chords because I haven't been practicing them. Instead of Not this. Yeah, so if I want to have a special like weight on it, I, I should just do it with keeping the violin at the same angle, but just with the arm weight. If I want to show something like some... I promise it won't take away from, from you showing the, the important notes. Mm -hmm. It's going to give you more gravity in your right arm more weight, more, more power. And you'll, you'll never feel like you have to come this way because the weight and power will be available at the, at the heel. How does that feel? Is does that feel very awkward to you or does that seem okay? Um, seems, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, the, I mean, another way to think about it is that, or the, something that I've been toying with, I, I also tend to bring my shoulder up in very unhelpful ways and it's kind of like a musical thing but it doesn't actually sound good. Um, I've been thinking about how the bow and the string can be almost like mag have a magnetic attraction to each other so that they come together here 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 anywhere you are in the bow they have this magnetic force where they need to to be together in a way that's very um powerful and and um you know if you have two very strong magnets attracted to each other it's hard to pull them apart right if your arm weight is released and available and your contact point is good, which yours is, most of you don't play down here, you know, you've got a good contact point, you'll have that feeling of attraction between the bow and the violin. Does that make sense? It's a weird concept, but I, I think you'll enjoy thinking about it. Before we run out of time, which is I, now I know why my guests are always like, oh, she's gonna cut me off because I'm talking too much and not letting you play enough. I wanted to bring up a musical thought with you and I'm not sure whether this is conscious or if you maybe need to record yourself playing a little bit more so that you hear it. There were places, my favorite place that you played actually musically was just after this next phrase. So you had the... You took a nice... Side out of tune. Before you went on, which I loved because it really showed me that you were thinking in, in these phrases and these groupings of notes. And that sets off, you know, we have a new voice, our melodies on the bottom, it's a new idea. As you went on, you stopped doing that and started running things together a little bit for my taste. Um, and it, I wondered if it was on purpose because. You also started playing with a more sort of romantic sound. So let can we jump ahead? The high stuff was beautiful. Um, 
you can think about that there are places in, in the high arpeggios where you can think about the bow distribution. He doesn't have any of those full bow marks in the high arpeggios, but you can think about that on your own. Can we skip to the third page? Mm -hmm. And I assume we have the same pages. Um, could you go from here? Ah, but play better than I just did. So this is the part where I'd like you to th consider maybe having a bit more of a Bach-like approach to it. Have you played the C major um, sonata? The Bach C major? Yes, some. Some, some of it. So this reminds me of some of the really glorious parts in that fugue. Because suddenly, we, you know, we're out of the E minor Merck, we're out of the sort of um, uh, duskier sounds on the first two pages, and we're just purely in this ecstatic major, right? Could you try again and really listen to the ends of your notes? So listen for, I'm going to leave out the chords. Do you want that or like, do you want it smeared together? Do you want it connected? Do you want it clean? And just, just play the same few bars that you played uh, just now and listen to that. You're so quick and you're changing on, on a dime. Do you hear where before you were sort of mushing the notes together a little bit? The one that really stood out to me was where you just stopped, which is my favorite part of the piece, but the... You could get a sort of um, exalted feeling to it if you take out some of the, the maybe unintended connections between notes. That would be a nice way of putting it. And I wouldn't be afraid to like, for instance, there's, take your bow off the string. The... You, you can afford to do that. You can be sure his eye wasn't always completely legato between things. Try one more time from uh, the... That sounds better to me. Um, then when you get to the place like and you were more legato, it it, it makes more sense. Um, and then similar, I would say this if you were playing a, a Bach fugue, I'm sure you've heard this before, you don't have to use your entire bow on every single note. <laughs> Right? So going back to the these big chords, just play the top notes. And play it the way you'd phrase that. So of the, the uh, three notes that have the big chords on them, the, which one do you think is the most, um, or the loudest, the, the highest point. Mm. I, I mean, I used to do the last one because it's just the biggest chord. Yeah, that's fine. So if that's those three notes, you want the last one to be the most. Now, is the that four note chord that's so exciting and beautiful more or less than, a, than the next downbeat? I think more. That's what you're playing. 
Yeah. Are you sure? Play just the melody again. Forget about the chords. Okay. Well, it's not less, definitely, but it has a more relaxed feeling to it. Good. So you want this note to have more tension in it. Then this is a release. So. So even still without the chords, change the color, change the articulation to reflect that. Now let's put, put the chords back in and see if that works. So musically, is that convincing to you? Yeah. To, yeah to let's just to throw a wrench in the works and see what you think. I think a lot of times if you're not, if you're being questioned on something or if you're not 100% sure you like something, the best way to figure it out is to challenge it. So let's challenge, so that worked. That was, that was more or less the idea you had. Now could you please lead the phrase to the downbeat? So make the downbeat the, the biggest. Okay, so that's another way of playing it. Do you like that more or less? more because it feels more open yeah so is it, by giving that upbeat so much importance and so much tension mm -hmm. you then lost the next three beats when we yeah. really want to get to the <laughs> so then we can go on so i would explore different possibilities when you practice. None of them are right or wrong. It's just what is more music, musically satisfying to you, mm -hmm. right? Um, and we're gonna stop in two minutes. I'm gonna give you one more thing to think about though in the little fugue, which is to do with vibrato. Mm -hmm. So I know these these intervals in, the, in this little fugue are very difficult to play, um, but I don't think that the easy ones deserve vibrato and the harder ones don't which is a little bit the approach we were getting. So could you just play, um, just go right from where the multi tranquillo is. And the other thing I want you to try is keep it pianissimo for as long as you dare. That had a better shape than, than what you had done when in your recording. And um, I would just challenge you to really pay, like know exactly what you're doing with your vibrato. In your video, it, it stood out to me because you gave the first note a lot of vibrato and then none. And I was pretty sure that wasn't on purpose, but then it stood out to me because then when you come to the difficult interval, the... There's no way you're gonna vibrate that lower B in the same way that you did the first note of the fugue. More things to think about. How how much bow do you really need? You're a single voice playing. It could be very tentative if you want it, or as you did, you could float the bow. But until you've tried about three or four different kinds of, of contact, you're not sure what would work the best. 
So I can see that, that, that Mark is nudging me on and saying it's time. Um, beautiful playing. It's a joy to hear you play. Um, thank you very much for, for being here, and I hope that's helpful. Thank you. No, it was like those images with the light, or it's good to keep it more stable. So it, It'll make a big difference. And then you can also start, to, we didn't get into this, but you can experiment more with how your arm is rotating under the violin to get your chords more comfortable. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Great, beautiful playing. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Bravo, people are saying. So we get to move to Saint-Saëns now. Um, I don't have anything to say. I don't have any banter here. We're just going to move right on. Casey is going to, to share. And Casey, I did decide that we'll stop... Um, about a page and a half before the end, so we, so we won't get the whole movement. Um, so don't be shocked when the video stops. And here is the first movement of Saint-Saëns' third concerto. <laughs>
double playing. All right, I'm gonna organize myself here. You're on my full screen. Wonderful, you can hear me okay? Good. All right, so you're gonna have to answer some questions for me as well, because I just, I'm always full of questions. Beauti it's really beautiful playing. Tell me how you feel about this piece. I like this piece. You like it? What do you like about it? Uh, it's very fun to play. It's fun to play? Do you like the more lyrical stuff or the fast show-off stuff? You like both, I'm guessing a little bit what you're saying because you're very soft-spoken. Fortunately, your violin playing is bold. So um, we can hear in the music what you're feeling, which is amazing. Um, and is there anything about your violin playing, if you could change it like that, what would you do? Um, I think I should breathe more so I'm not as tense. I, you think you should breathe more so breathe more did, did I get that you think you should breathe more do you mean sort of so that you're more comfortable or do you think that the music should breathe more um, so that it doesn't make everything tense to be more comfortable so okay that's interesting do you feel kind of like you're holding like holding in a little bit and you wish you could just sort of go like this Okay, yeah, I think we all feel like that. It's very easy to get in our heads. It's very easy to let things that we're trying to do well um, take over and, and, it's, and get in the way of the music making that we want to make. I think you play this extraordinarily well. There are so many challenges in this movement. And I was laughing when I was getting ready for today because I pulled out my music and I have a part probably from when I was about your age when I learned this piece. And it's got like markings on every single note. And it's, I can see the handwriting of at least three different teachers, plus my own handwriting, plus my mother's handwriting. I mean, this is a heavily used part. And then I apparently at some point got frustrated with that and I bought a brand new clean part that doesn't even have fingerings in it. And then I also have a fancy Henley part that is supposed to be the, the real, the urtext, right? And that was just amusing me because I know how, how much effort it takes to play this, this piece well. It's so virtuosic. And so that got me thinking a little bit about why. Why is it difficult? What, what is difficult in this first movement? Well, they're the big shifts that everyone worries about, right? the big octave leap, which you hit every time, and then the 10th leap, which is absolutely great. Um, the octave passages, which you played brilliantly. The high notes that kind of come out of nowhere, all, all taken care of very well. And then there are the, the slow, beautiful, lyrical bits, which need to sound effortless. And, and uh, I, I think they sound suave. There's like a, a uh, beauty and and um, sort of almost flirtatiousness to them, but but it's just so singing and and elegant that kind of music. And then there's the fiery passage work. If you had to pick one of those things, like the big the big jumps, the things like that that are difficult, the lyrical music that is hard to make sound easy, <laughs> and the really fast notey music, which is the hardest for you? Or has given you the most trouble. You're you're doing them all well. Um, maybe the semi-quaver bits. I missed that. Maybe the semi-quaver bits. The yeah. the fast stuff. Yeah. Do you know why? I'm I'm torturing you by making you talk to me, but um, I'll tell you why I find it difficult. It's the notes that Sanson chooses. <laughs> to make us play. And this is gonna bring me to something that has on on the surface kind of nothing to do with how you played this piece. But um, I assume you practice your scales and your arpeggios and you, you play them for your teacher and you've done all of your, all the, have you gone through all of the keys of scales and arpeggios and maybe even double stop scales and, and things like that? Good. So 
We practice scales and arpeggios for a lot of different reasons, right, as violinists. One of the reasons that I practice them is to warm up. It's a nice way to get your hands moving. It's also a great way to learn to play in tune. If you can play in tune in a key, then when you play a piece in that key, it's much easier for you to find the resonance of the violin. There are lots of other reasons, but those are two, two basic reasons. I want to think about, instead of like technically why we practice scales and arpeggios, what the scales and arpeggios mean to the composer. And I, I saw in your biography that you, you write music, so you use scales and arpeggios in whatever way that, that makes sense to you. But when a composer like Sasson, who wrote this piece, I looked it up, in 1880, when he was choosing to write in B minor, it meant something, right? It had a character. So I want to do a little bit of experimentation with you to find the meaning behind the notes that Sasson chooses to write and see if that can help you actually breathe a little bit more easily and feel more comfortable. So let's take a lyrical part first. All right, let's skip to the first big melodic bit, which for me is on the top of the second page. Let me just, actually no, it's where the key changes. Grab my violin, the big B major melody. Do you know where I mean? I don't have bar numbers here. Uh, could you play that? You know, play two or three phrases worth. Beautiful. Do you know what key this this is in? How many sharps are there? You have four sharps, so what key is that? E major. Yeah? So let's do a little bit of recomposing. Sometimes like I was having Magdalena try moving things to different parts of bow, trying different different uh, phrase shapes to be sure what she likes. Let's imagine that we could recompose this. Could you, and I, there's no, I'm not looking for absolute perfection here. Could you play the same melody in a minor key? Yeah, exactly. So instead of, uh, it, it, I'm asking you to do something silly, but instead of, what does it sound like? And really just concentrate on the quality of the, of the expression of minor versus major. Try it in minor again, play the, play the wrong notes again. Any, any thoughts on the feeling? If Sansa had written it that way, could you put a, an expressive word to that? Sad. It's definitely more sad, right? Now, could you play it with the correct notes this time? And as, as sad as that was, make the major whatever it, it needs to be. So that just makes you smile, right? Because you've got the... Instead of... Now, can we go back and remember how this piece starts? So I loved that you had the piano accompaniment in your video because we could hear the... That minor chord, right? And you play... Can you just play the first three bars of the, of the piece? Now, could you play the same thing in major?
good. Now, he actually does that in the piece, so it doesn't sound so weird to us because it, it happens. What is the difference of feeling? It's happier, or and if the beginning, I don't know how you feel about this. I always feel it's like some, oh, uh, maybe some, not completely well-meaning hero walks onto stage and plays the. Feels a little bit evil, a little bit nefarious to me. This. Everything changes because of one note. Right. Do you see what I'm getting at? I know it doesn't have that much to do with violin playing, but it has to do with how you're thinking about the violin playing. And it might end up meaning that you use a different kind of bow speed, or you use a different kind of vibrato, or maybe you play in the upper half versus the lower half, because it needs to have a different expression. And that's what I feel like is the next step for you, is figuring out how to use all of these skills that you have with violin playing to make the music become both um, three-dimensional, but also kind of larger than life, instead of just existing in these little miniature ideas in our head, that the, it's almost like the visions of how you want the music explode out of your head in, in a way that no one can miss, right? That's what we're looking for. So let's find another spot. Um, could you play, I'm, we're gonna jump around. This is gonna be the weirdest, sort of non-linear lesson you've ever had. But if you have this, another time you play, could you jump to the place that you play there? I have letter C. Ah, see, you're right. I, I fooled you there. Sorry, I wasn't looking. Yeah, that was in major. Play it again. Different feeling? Play the beginning again. As written. And then play this one at C. Does it need more bow or less bow? Experiment. Try using um, try using less bow at at the first one and more bow for this this major one that's higher. Use even more bow, like a wild amount. Maybe that has a different quality. Now let's think about the vibrato. Go back to the first one and think about the kind of vibrato you're using. And then go to the, the major one that's higher. And before you play, think about it. We can change the width and the speed of our vibrato, right? Which do you want to change? You don't have to tell me, just do it. So your vibrato was a little bit quicker, a little bit narrower. Can you do the same thing with more bow? Do it with an insane amount of bow, end to end. I think you're you're cheating on the last bit on both ends. Really, I know it's it's it'll it'll feel out of control. I want it to feel out of control. Good. Was that harder to play? No, it's just different, right? So as you're practicing these things, think about the quality of sound that you want and what you need to change to get it, all based on the harmonies. Now, I promised that we'd, we'd look at these, these passages and, and think about... Now, so we've talked a little bit about minor and major harmonies and how they feel different. Um, what about arpeggios? So let's, I mean, again, we're just jumping around. I'm being really cruel. But could you play that passage? 
And what kind of arpeggio is that? Just D major, right? And what kind of feeling does a major arpeggio usually have? Just happy, right? Happy, triumphant. You could, I mean, you could get really specific if you want to, but could you make that D major arpeggio bright, sunshine, as like the happiest you've ever felt? <laughs> And did you get sad at the top? Because you shouldn't, you're playing in tune. Better, and can you make it just sort of, again, way out of the scale of what you think is okay. Lose a little bit of control at the top. And vibrate on every D, except for the open D. And, and rush, go too fast. Good. Okay, so now we have this really excited D major. Play the next arpeggio that comes right after that. How is that different? I mean, obviously you have a different note. It's an augmented triad. What, what is the feeling? Just show me in, in how you're playing. Could you let it go all rip all the way to the top? Don't don't give up on it. That's brilliant. Could you do the two in a row now? Great. So the augmented triad to me has a little bit more tension, but it's sort of it's an excited kind of tension, right? It makes you want, and then you have in the orchestra there as a result of it, right? It has to lead to the next thing. That's a very obvious place because they're right back to back. But as you go through, I think you'll find that almost every passage is either going to be a mi some kind of variation of a minor arpeggio or a diminished arpeggio or a major arpeggio. There aren't very many major ones. They're mostly minor and diminished. And the difference in feeling between minor chords and diminished chords is enormous. Minor can be sad and depressed and dark and gloomy. Diminished, almost always, this is a terrible generalization, but I'm gonna make it anyway, almost always means trouble. It's trouble or mis mystery. So when you play something like, I'm gonna jump again, let's find a good one. There are a bunch on the first page. Um, this passage. Can play it better, Bay. Just minor, right? Then uh, diminished. Some there's trouble, and then the trouble goes away. Trouble, mystery. And you can <laughs> pretty much, it's like paint by numbers. Do you, did you ever have that, that kind of thing where you, you know, you see a one and so you put red and you see a two and you put yellow. Diminished means mystery or trouble or expectation. It doesn't have to be negative, but there's some kind of unsettling feeling that goes along with diminished. Now, the other thing that goes along with diminished is there's no good fingering, which is why these passages are so difficult because you don't have fifths to base your fingerings around. You're always shifting or sort of compressing your hand in an, in an uncomfortable way. And that's why they don't feel good under the hand. But if you can concentrate on the feeling of them, they become much more fun. Does that make sense? So I hope that wasn't too disjointed. That's not at all. I thought we were gonna talk about, about um, sort of using the, the heel of your bow because you seem to be a little bit allergic to the bottom of your bow and but then I just started thinking about these colors and, and the different kinds of sounds and, and related to the fact that you feel like you'd like to be able to breathe more freely and I think if you could focus your mind on the colors and sort of the you know if we're going back to this idea of why and how the why of why did Saint-Saëns put these notes in this order and what effect does that have? How do I want it to feel? 
if you can wrap your mind around that, everything else will become easier. You play so beautifully, and, and I have no doubt that you'll you'll sort out violinistic things and things will become easier and then they'll get harder again and then easier and that it's just the nature of violin playing um something you can do one day the next day feels like you've never done before um so that's to be expected but i think that that sort of musical approach will go a long ways for you that makes sense great thank you so much for playing casey it's a pleasure to meet you and hear you and i hope to meet you in person someday and shake your hand Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for playing. Um, I'm going to wrap it up there. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions, but if you do, feel free to ask them. And otherwise, I think I'll tell you a little bit about what's coming up next for the really big class. Um, I'm going to go to gallery view. This is so weird to be doing on my own. I don't see any. Oh, Simon's got a question. Hi, Simon. Hi, how, uh, let me just come so people can see who, what I actually look like. I'm there. I'm there. Fantastic class, as, as ever. Brilliantly well played. Ladies. Um, yeah, all ladies. Fantastic. There were, there were just a couple of little uh, kind of observations I had. Y you will have seen from my picture, uh, the girls who played, that I, I'm a conductor. But I am also, um, I spent 30 years as a violinist and I have pretty much the same background as, uh, as Cecily does. I was in a string quartet and did all of those kind of wonderful things. Um, there were just a couple of things that struck me and, and, and I hope you, you wouldn't mind me saying them. No, but, um, Magdalena, when the, the Alamand was first invented, it was it was a dancing duple time. So that's how it began. So maybe Isai is reflecting that it's duple to start with and then it became triple when it became uh, a, a German dance as it were. So maybe look at the, that, that first foray literally as like an introduction to, to Sinatra singing a song. <laughs> give, give the foray the just, it's just you kind of, is Isai giving us the, 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 the Chrysler opening, if you like, before he gives us the, the true German dance allemande. So see it as improvisation, lead us somewhere, you know, and as you come down, there's a pause. Make the pause before you play in the three eight. I think just you know, because you can give us something special. It's like you're lining this thing up. It's, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. We don't know what it is. It's coming. It's coming. And then, then you give it to us. But brilliant playing, really, really, very, very lovely. Um, Casey, good work. Thirteen years old. My God, I wish I'd been that good at thirteen. I didn't pick a violin up till I was eleven. So, um, yeah, God, if I could have played the sound song of 13, I think I'd have I'd maybe had a, a longer career. Um, I, what I would say is go listen to some old violinists, some really good old ones. And where I would start is with somebody like Alfredo Campoli, who is the most amazingly beautiful um, player of violin music. When I was a little older than you are, I was about 16, I became besotted with his concerto uh, performance of the Tchaikovsky. And to, 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 so much so that I can sing in F sharp. Because that's how it begins. And it's so stuck in my head that, that, that I know what an F sharp sounds like. Um, Tamara, also very, very beautiful. What, what lovely playing. Um, but don't feel that you have to be so rigid in the rhythm. Take, you know, shapes. And it's like being on, on, on a bit of a roller coaster. And, and as Cecily said so brilliantly, tell a story. Imagine that nobody knows this piece. I know it's a famous concerto and everybody's supposed to know it, but just imagine there are going to be people in the audience the, the first time you play it that have never heard it before. Can you imagine how exciting that must be? God, I'd be, I'd be, be amazed to, to, to be there um, just to hear it for the first time. So, so, so go with that. But everything that Cecily told you is just, it's golden. The golden advice and challenging yourselves to the way you play is just, yeah, why? I always ask, my wife says, so what? Because in her role as an administrator at university, people keep constantly saying, yes, but so what? So what? Keep saying so what to yourselves, yeah? It's Simon, a um, yeah. Casey's just asking in the chat if you could spell the violinist's name you mentioned. Oh, Campoli. It's C-A-M-P-O-L-I. And his first name was Alfredo. So that's Alfredo. Alfredo Campoli. He, he emigrated from Italy when he was 
16 years old, I think. And when he came to the UK, um, because he was running away from, from uh, Italy wasn't a great place to be uh, in the 20s and the 30s. So he ran away with his family. And when he came here, he could play already, I think it was 12 violin concertos from memory as a 16 year old. And he had 22 recital programs, all from memory. <laughs> and he's an br absolutely brilliant violinist. Um, Tamara, there's a great story about him that you would like. He uh, played a lot with uh, a British conductor called Malcolm Sargent. Um, uh, I believe it was Sargent. It might've been Beecham, but I think it was Sargent. And uh, they were due to play a concerto with a Halle in Manchester. Uh, Campoli lived in London, so we went out and he said, should, I, should we rehearse? And Sargent said, no, we've done this piece a load of times. You, you know how it goes, just meet me there. So anyway, they, they walks off and Campoli walks on to, to play a concerto, only to discover in a bar and a half that he's playing the Mendelssohn when he thought he was playing in the brook. So can you imagine, you've got a bar and a half to think, oh my God, la -da -dee, la -da -dee. So um, yeah, but he's an amazing, an amazing violinist. It really is. Um, I, can't, I can't recommend him highly enough. It'll, it'll sound a little strange, Case, when you first hear him, because it's a very kind of old school sound, but you will, you'll hear how he, he plays this, this concert. There's a great recording of it. Um, there are four recordings of the, 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 uh, that are on the same disc. Tchaikovsky, Lalo, Symphony Espanol, um, Sanson, and I can't remember, what, the other one might be Beethoven, but I'm not really sure. So um, have a little listen, cheeky. I will find that and, and post it. You should, but brilliant class. And I'm so sorry not to have been in, in all the, the hundred others. Oh, I'm glad uh, to see you here today. Well, it's it's lovely. Fun. Thank you very much for accommodating me. You're very kind. Good luck, ladies. Good luck. Thank you all for for playing to me and, and for being here for this class. Um, I'm going to take a couple weeks break and do two chamber music classes in April. I'll do a third one if I get more people who would like to play. So if, if you want to uh, play some chamber music in a class, let me know. Or if you know anyone who's got a duo or trio or quartet rehearsing, maybe they're, they're flatmates or siblings or able to be in the same space, whatever works, uh, let me know. And then May is going to be a complete change of direction. I can't be more, could not be more excited. New Music Month in the really big class where we have four composers, four violinists, and we're going to talk about um, mutual inspiration and also looking at older music, so established repertoire through the eyes of a composer. So some of the most amazing uh, coachings or, or sort of input my quartet ever had on music of Mozart or Beethoven or Mendelssohn actually came from the composers who we had commissioned to write music that we performed alongside these other works. So um, you never know what a composer will hear um, that you've never even noticed before. So I'm very excited to be bringing that to the big class in May. Uh, have a wonderful Easter, and uh, for those of us off of, of school in our, in our holidays, I hope you're able to get some downtime and stay well and stay safe, and we'll end the live stream. Thanks very much.